where the coal lay near the surface, they dug trenches to get it. And then coal mining developed. Two kinds of mine were used. One was sunk into an outcrop of coal from the surface. It was known as a bell pit because of its shape. The other was a drift mine, driven into the hillside or river bank where the coal seam emerged. In the drift mines, two or three miners won the coal, while boys or women dragged it to the entrance. Then the need for coal increased. By the 14th century, artisans were using it extensively in their workshops. And in 1367, it was allowed to be exported to Calais. So these hillside workings were often extended deeper. The coal was easy to get as only the best and the thickest seams were worked. They were threatened by only two dangers, water and stale air. Stale air, choke damp which could suffocate and kill. The only sign of its presence was the slowly dimming candle. If seen in time, it could be dispersed by fanning the air, which the miner would do with his jacket or any piece of cloth kept handy for the purpose. And as the miners dug deeper into the rock, they met a new danger. Now, if choke damp was present and the miner tried to disperse it, he would often waft an explosive mixture of fire damp and air onto his candle. Another dangerous sort of bad air, but of a fiery nature like lightning, which blasts and tears all before it if it take hold of the candle. Men and workings were destroyed by one explosion after another. The only solution was to fire the gas deliberately. Several times a day, firemen, as they were most aptly called, would enter the mine and each in his own way would prepare to fire the pockets of gas. Here, one would hide himself in a shallow hole beneath some timber. Another, often called the penitent, from the monk-like nature of his protective rags, would approach the area of danger with a candle on a pole. Then, in one way or another, the gas would be ignited. So the mine was made safe for a few hours. Neither drainage nor ventilation are sufficiently attended to with the help and comfort of the work people in the majority of cases. Whereas in some, the ventilation is so imperfect that it is positively dangerous. Fire damp remained the gravest danger. Miners became skilled in detecting its presence by the flames of their naked candles. But even so, Every week, several miners and boys were killed or burnt by fire and explosion. But when explosives were used for blasting coal, and a hand drill was the only tool, a good light was essential. In any case, as the fuse was only a slender hollow stalk filled with powder, a candle was needed to light it. With the blasting of coal came a new hazard, explosive coal dust. Disaster followed disaster. Within two years, 600 men were killed in Tyne and Weir. In 1812, at Felling Colliery, 92 men were killed. Something had to be done. The Sunderland Society was formed for the sole purpose of finding a remedy. It appealed to Sir Humphrey Davy for help. Within a year, he produced a lamp which he and others who believed in it took underground to prove to the miners that it could be used in a fiery pit without igniting the gas. It is, he said, the best thing I ever did. But a magistrate said, 
I have always been of the opinion that though Davy's lamp was a valuable discovery, it has in practice been much abused, for it has enabled colliers to work where they otherwise ought not. I wish to add that when it is used, an explosion may be produced by the imprudence of any single individual. The only safety is a perfect ventilation. Fire baskets were the first artificial means of ventilation. They were lowered down a shaft. The fire caused the air to rise in that shaft and to circulate in the workings. These fire baskets later became huge furnaces placed near to the base of the upcast shaft and were in use until the coming of mechanical fans. As the mines became bigger, the working faces only were supplied with a flow of air. But this left large parts of the mine unventilated, and they filled up with dangerous pockets of gas. Then, by the use of ventilation doors and brick stoppings, the air was made to circulate throughout the whole mine. But in doing so, it had to travel so far that it became highly charged with gas and would often explode when it reached the furnace. A remedy for this danger was put forward by an anonymous writer who called himself a rational friend to schemes of improvement. He suggested dividing the mine into a greater number of independent systems of ventilation so disposed that each wagon road should form part of an air course. The great John Buddle put this system into practice and brought about a revolution in the ventilation of coal mines. At last, the safety of the men who won the coal was slowly catching up with other advances. Below ground, ventilation became better and safety lights were improved. 